Welcome, Don. We're here with Donald uh, K. Tamaki, uh, founder of Minami Tamaki uh, LLC law firm, and of course, uh, one of the Quorum Nobis attorneys. Uh, Don, welcome. Thank you. Um, Don, at, at a meeting at Del Minami's house in Oakland in May 8, 9, 1982, I know it's a while ago, uh, attorney Peter Irons met with a group of young idealistic attorneys. Uh, and students to discuss, discover, or to discuss the evidence that Aiko Herza Yoshinaga uh, had uncovered. Um, and uh, he was also there to share his idea to reopen the Korematsu, Hirabayashi, and Yasui cases uh, through this little known Quorum Nobis process. Uh, you were amongst those idealistic young attorneys. What do you remember about that initial meeting and how did that impact you? Well, it was amazing. We were skeptical that a, you know, researcher and a couple of them, Aiko Yoshinaga Herzig and, and Peter Irons, uh, uncovered evidence that would lead to reopen this infamous case that uh, occurred, you know, some 36, 37 years earlier. You know, every law student, lawyer is familiar with Korematsu versus United States. It's recognized as one of the worst decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court and characterized as a civil liberties disaster. The idea of reopening that case, especially when it involved our own families and uh, our own community, was unthinkable. Peter uh, sought us out and uh, a meeting was held and he it brought with him copies of uh, intelligence files from the FBI, the Federal Communications, the Navy, uh, Justice Department memos that uh, characterized the Army's claims of General DeWitt as, quote, intentional falsehoods and fabrications. And every intelligence report having any responsibility with national security on the, on the West Coast had also basically said that none of DeWitt's claims that Japanese Americans were a dangerous population or spying uh, were correct. They were all false. So as we saw this, um, and again, whistleblower memos going back and forth between Justice Department uh, lawyers having really an ethical dilemma about whether they ought to be lying to the U.S. Supreme Court. That was remarkable. The other remarkable thing is that Peter would come to primarily Japanese American attorneys as uh, a, the means to reopen this case. So it was uh, was a momentous meeting. So the Quorum Novus cases petitions were formally announced at a press conference January 19th, 1983, 40 years ago. Um, this was uh, at the height of some Japan bashing and Vincent Chen, of course, uh, would have been killed in Detroit six months earlier, um, being mistaken for Japanese. Uh, under those circumstances, was there any uh, trepidation in trying to right this wrong at that time um, about a wrong committed in World War II, which was a super patriotic war? And what challenges did the legal team face in trying to overcome uh, some potential hostility? Well, unlike today, you know, one of the challenges was ignorance in getting ready for announcing this um, reopening this ancient Supreme Court case. I called up news desks and these are, you know, these are well, you know, educated journalists who, uh, they're traffic directors for news that comes in. And when we announced that we we're going to reopen Korematsu versus the United States, uh, first question is, well, what's, what's that? And when we talked about the incarceration of Japanese Americans, the journalist said, What's that about? That happened in America. Uh, aren't you talking about Japanese prisoners of war? And I said, no, these are Americans, 120,000 of them, 70,000 who were citizens by birth, um, you know, removed and taken away into 10 American style concentration camps. And this was quite remarkable uh, to the journalists. They did um, immediately gravitate toward it because it involved elements of, of suppression of evidence, uh, a historical wrong, um, and, and you know, following Watergate, which was the um, 
misconduct by the Nixon administration and the cover-up was of that nature. And so uh, we happened to hit on a very slow news day. And it was, in many cases, the lead story for uh, network television nationally, as well as front page of the major publications like the New York Times and the Washington Post, as well as uh, local coverage. The message was, although this involved our community, it was a matter of American democracy in which all three institutions of government, the legislative branch, which was Congress, the presidency, and ultimately the judicial branch, all failed and basically collapsed, demonstrating you know, the perils to democracy when racism shouts louder than the Constitution. Um, so a hearing November 10th, 1983, San Francisco District Court, um, there was reportedly attended by 300 people, mostly Nisei and Sansei, uh, and Judge Marilyn Hall Patel was randomly assigned to the case. Uh, what do you remember about that hearing and um, what was the energy in the room? There were three things going on here thematically. I mean, one, I think the legal team, as well as the Japanese American community, were out to vindicate our own families. And, uh, you know, everybody, of course, knew that the roundup was wrong and they were victims, but the conventional wisdom and the history of the time was that this was a grave mistake. Well, what uh, Peter Irons and Aiko Yoshinaga Hertzik uncovered and what the cases of Fred Gorm Korematsu, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Min Yasui revealed was that this was more than a mistake. Uh, what may have started as racial wartime hysteria ultimately culminated at the highest levels of our legal system, right at the very top, the Attorney General, the US Supreme Court, the Solicitor General, as a calculated plan to manipulate the outcome of this momentous decision and the imprisonment of a huge American population even if it meant lying to the U.S. Supreme Court, with our own families at the center of the scandal of epic proportions. So certainly that was one reason why the room was filled with camp survivors who, who in essence, w wanted to have, were experiencing the trials that they never had. I think the second thing was to impair the legal precedent of Korematsu versus the United States, which you know, stands for the proposition that without evidence, without trial, an entire population of Americans could be deprived of their homes, their property, their businesses, for some even their lives, without any due process whatsoever. So the impairment of that legal dangerous principle was very important. And then the third principle was win or lose this case. It was critical for the sake of American history uh, to make sure that this never happens again to any other group. And so that hearing had deep meaning. We did not know at the time how the court was going to rule, Merrill, Judge Marilyn Hall Patel. Um, the US government had continued to defend these cases uh, on the grounds that there was a military necessity and there was a reason for the roundup truth was on the line, facts were on the line, the meaning of the Constitution was on the line. So it was a big day. So uh, how do you think the decision uh, by Judge Patel to vacate Fred Kodamatsu's conviction impacted the movement for Japanese American redress? Well, the fact that the case arose uh, at the same time, uh, contemporaneously with the Japanese American redress and reparations movement was just luck. Two things that intersected. I mean, Peter Irons was out to investigate and write a book about uh, these momentous decisions. And he happened to cross paths with Aiko Yoshinaga Hertzik, who was hired as a researcher for the Commission on uh, Wartime uh, Relocation and Internment of Civilians. And the two of them just struck, uh, you know, a fast friendship and shared information. The fact that 
the timing of our the case of Judge Patel's ruling coincided with uh, the movement and, and the lobbying effort going on for the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, um, and and that whole movement was was uh, an incredible good fortune. The fact that Judge Patel, the court ruled that the government had lied to the U.S. Supreme Court, that there was no reason for this roundup. And more, most importantly, the government knew it at the time, but intentionally suppressed, altered, and destroyed evidence. In one case, intelligence report from the Navy by burning it, you know, not only, you know, established that this was not a mistake. This was uh, an intentional fraud on the high court with our own community, our own families as, you know, the victims of this. I think that gave impetus uh, and even more meaning and more importance that a great wrong had to be repaired. And I think it boosted the reparations uh, movement because it said to those people, no, this was not a mistake. Uh, this was um, an intentional act and all the more reason and all the more justification uh, for reparations. So one of the, I guess one of the lasting impacts of the 1983 decisions is uh, you're reflected in your work in Stop Repeating History, drawing parallels between wartime incarceration and contemporary discrimination. Can you tell us a little bit about what Stop Repeating History is and what it does? Well, it was spurred uh, by the Trump administration and uh, what was going on, and the denialism of facts and of science. And it, it just occurred to the Korematsu and Hirabayashi and Yasui legal teams that this is history repeating all over again. And we know full well uh, of a time when our own community experienced um, when facts didn't matter, the law didn't matter, the constitution didn't matter. What mattered at the time was conspiracy theories, fear, scapegoating, fear, fear mongering and scapegoating, and politicians who used um, Japanese Americans as the stepping stone to advance their own political careers. And fast forward to January of uh, 2017, when Trump issued the th first of thrice revised um, orders banning travel from six uh, Muslim-majority nations. Americans were caught literally midair in flights uh, un or unable to board airplanes that they had valid tickets for. Refugees uh, fleeing terror who'd already undergone a stringent 18th month vetting program were denied entry at the border. And all in the name of national security, you know, we, we reason that uh, this similarly to Japanese American history was not a question so much of national security, but rather fulfilling a campaign promise that Trump had made on just about every whistle stop on the campaign trail, vilifying uh, Muslims and Americans as being terrorists. And what followed, everybody can remember, Asian Americans were characterized as the spreaders of the Chinese virus. Mexicans were called drug dealers and rapists. Uh, Jews and immigrants were characterized as being poised to replace white people by supremacists. And throughout the Trump administration and years before and even today, countless uh, black people dying at the hands of law enforcement and it rarely evoked a shrug. So the reasoning behind Stop Repeating History is just that. Um, it's important to understand that this is a recycling kind of event that we ought to be concerned about. And more than that, the Japanese American experience and the Korematsu case in particular uh, demonstrates really the collapse of democracy. And we saw that in real time on, on January 6th of, of 2021, when the Capitol you know, became under siege, uh, five people died 25,000 troops were deployed to, to protect the peaceful transfer of power that we, we haven't seen in mo modern history. And literally, the upshot is millions believe the election was stolen, despite the utter lack of any evidence 
uh, fraud that would have made any difference. And so looking at the Japanese American experience, looking at the Korematsu case, I mean, we can learn a lot from that history. And regrettably, that learning part is deeply relevant to what's going on today. Great, thank you. And pivoting over to black reparations now. Um, you had been appointed by Governor Newsom to the state's Black Reparations Task Force uh, and serve as its only non-Black member. Why do you think it's important for Japanese Americans to support Black reparations? Well, there's no equivalence, of course, between what Japanese Americans went through, including four years in a concentration camp and losing their property and their businesses and so on, to 246 years of enslavement 90 years of Jim Crow and decades more of exclusion, racial terror, and discrimination. Uh, the experiences are not comparable, but we do know something about profiling, racial profiling. We know something about exclusion. We know something about the vilification. And more, more than that, uh, the Japanese American Redress Reparations movement is one of the very few examples in modern history where the United States government acknowledged a great wrong, apologized for it, and put some money behind it to atone for that wrong. And so there are parallels that can be shared with the movement. I would also say that Japanese American organizations in particular uh, and the community itself understands the healing that reparations provides. And I'm not talking about just the money part. I'm talking about being acknowledged as a full and equal American uh, entitled to all the rights of the Constitution and our democratic system. And that's something that historically has been denied uh, to Black people decade after decade after de decade, era after era. And so to the extent that we can show allyship. And I remember, you know, the black community supported us. Congressional Black Caucus supported us. Mervyn Dimely, Ron Dellums, uh, and others supported our movement. So as a matter of reciprocity, as a matter of justice, it's important that we take a stand for them. And that goes across to every other group that has benefited from the progress fought for by black, black Americans. Without the civil rights movement, Asian Americans, including Japanese Americans, uh, Latinos, women, the disabled uh, LBGTQ uh, organizations and, and people would not be where we are. I think it's important, reparations is really so much more than, you know, it's being characterized by in particular right-wing media is just a handout. It, it's really more about shining a light on this racial pathology that began in 1619 and continued through every chapter of American history thereafter, uh, right to the present day. And so I think it's the responsibility of everyone to get involved in this. And Japanese Americans, because of our personal experience, can offer help as well and, and allyship. Great, thank you. Um, so Evanston, Illinois had, uh, I think already given black residents 25,000 to, uh, to go towards down payment of a home or mortgages or repairs. Many municipalities and government bodies are currently conducting studies such as uh, yours for the black reparations. Um, U.S. Senator Cory Booker reintroduced uh, legislation to, to create a federal body, a federal commission and San Francisco uh, Black Reparations Task Force is proposing $5 million uh, payment to Black residents who to atone for uh, historical issues of racism. Um, if multiple layers of government bodies offer such redress to Black residents, is there any discussion to either consolidate or have one supersede the other? Not that I've heard of, um, but I think, I think it's significant that there is a movement now. Remember, you know, after the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was passed, uh, 
Uh, literally the next year, 1989, John Conyers of Michigan introduced a bill crafted really after the 1980 uh, bill that created the um, commission for us uh, to study uh, reparations. And that was followed eight years later by a real reparations bill, Civil Liberties Act of 1988. But the Conyers Bill of 89 was a, a bill to, again, study this uh, process. And it barely got a few sponsors and over the next 34 years languished. And um, it has about you know 200 co-sponsors, all Democrats, but has not even made it to a House floor for a vote or a debate. And so when it comes to black people in America, Congress has not shown the political will even to study reparations, let alone do anything about it. And so local jurisdictions have taken up the, the mantle on this and move forward. California is the only state in the country uh, that's created a, a commission to do this, to look into it and seriously consider it. I think that was at the heels of the May 25th, 2020 murder of George Floyd, which in turn triggered the largest protests in American history. And if you look at the footage from those protests, they're very multi-racial. So I think there was a bit of an awakening that her had occurred. And so people are in many different areas looking into it at the local level. Uh, despite Congress's refusal to even even take this up. But there is no coordination among all those different uh, jurisdictions. Each are pursuing in the best way they think they, they should. <clears throat> so uh, one common argument is that, uh, of course, you hear this all the time, California was not a slave state. Um, how do you respond to that line of questioning? And do you think that black reparations has a potential to uh, to have uh, to alienated alienating other groups that have been disenfranchised throughout the history of the state, uh, such as Native Americans, Mexicans, Mexican Americans, and uh, you know the Chinese who worked on the railroads? Well, I would say that unpacking black reparations explains a lot about the other isms against Native people, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Latinos Americans, and so on. Much of what we talk about, which is based on skin color, has its common origin, and that's 1619. And after the abolition of slavery in 1865, five minutes after Robert E. Lee surrendered, the South was determined to reinstate the old ways, and it did. The hate that was primarily targeted against black people and continues to be so uh, in different forms, merely morphed in, into other targets and other forms of racial bias, uh, which put other people of color in the crosshairs historically from time to time. But I think the one historical co uh, constant is the bias against black people and maybe perhaps native people and everybody else in between. With a cultural system or norm that values white lives above all others. As to the argument that California entered the union as a non-slave uh, slave state, that's true in 1850, but it was plenty complicit with the institution of slavery. So by 1852, California had passed its own versions of fugitive slave acts, which if there were any free black people in the state of California, they could be arrested, dragged before a court, and deported to the South, either to be re-enslaved if they were uh, fugitives, or to be enslaved anew. At that time, California had already passed laws forbidding uh, Black people from testifying in court uh, against white people. 1854, the California Supreme Court likewise made that true for Chinese Americans, Asian Americans. So what that meant is that people could be kidnapped, they could be taken away, they could be re-enslaved, they could be murdered, uh, being victims of robbery with impunity. And uh, Democrats rose to power in California by declaring that this was going to be a white state. And they vowed that native people, 
Asian Americans and black people would never have equal rights. So Jim Crow definitely followed um, into the state of California. And although the California Constitution had banned slavery, there were no laws making it a crime for enslavers to bring their human property with them. And they did that in, in terms of working the mines and working the fields and providing domestic labor. Yes, California had in, in enslavement. More than that, by the turn of the century, and certainly in the, in the 1920s, California became known as a strong Ku Klux Klan state with strong uh, Klan memberships in San Francisco, in, in Oakland, in Los Angeles, in Riverside, even in San Jose, Kern County. I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands of, of members within each of those uh, cities that um, also, you know, were the leaders of the legislature and the leaders in uh, civic organizations and institutions such, such as the police department and in education. Um, in turn, that led to redlining. Um, by the 1940s, about 80% of the homes in Los Angeles had racially restrictive covenants banning uh, the sale of houses to black families. Um, and so it became, even though California is not a slave state, it, it was became a leader in uh, racial segregation and in redlining. And so um, if you look at the redlining maps of the 1940s in San Francisco Bay Area or in Los Angeles, and you align those maps to current day pre-gentrification maps of the most underserved, impoverished, uh, most ultra segregated communities, those maps align exactly. So this tradition of policies that divided the country up into black and white neighborhoods, California was all in. And the harm continued through each era and the outcomes we see in our cities and in all parts of the state today. Uh, for example, in education and housing, you know, segregation is about the same as it was in the 1940s. Black people uh, have shorter life expectancies. The infant mortality rate is three to five times more. Uh, the wealth gap between families of white families uh, and their assets and black families and their assets is literally nine times. And so these outcomes, I would say, are cumulative. They're uh, compounded and they're cascading to create our current day reality. So we can learn a lot about today by just examining what has happened previously. So the argument that you know California was a not a non was a non-slave state, although technically true, the outcomes were very much Jim Crow. And so I think um, I mean who knew that Glendale, Pasadena. Culver City were sundown towns until we started to look into this and study this. I, I didn't know, and I, I feel I'm fairly well read in American history. So there's a lot that California was involved in that I think the California public needs to know. Um, in what ways does the movement for Japanese American redress in the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 inform this particular movement for black reparations and how is it totally different? Well, in many ways, it's totally different. I mean, there is no equivalence again between um, what happened to us and what's happened historically tracing back to 1619. There just isn't, it's not comparable. On the other hand, the movement for reconciliation, the movement for acknowledgement and some form of monetary atonement is directly applicable. The racial profiling aspect, the, uh, it, the failure of democracy and uh, the cultural norms that make racist systemic exclusion completely normal and acceptable, that, that's, that's the same. So um, 
I think there are, are, are certainly great differences, but certainly there are, are great similarities. I think it also reflects what I'll call the, the racial hierarchy. And that is the, the racial atmosphere that propped up the institution of slavery and justified it for two and a half centuries, 246 years, plus another 90 years of Jim Crow, that set the, the racial environment for, the, for everybody else. So, so for example, um, California entered the union in 1850 and in the 1860s, the California legislature immediately uh, went to work with laws excluding and targeting black Americans. But there were very few black Americans in the state of California at the time. So who became the target? Asian Americans, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans. By the 1920s, the turn of the century, when Japanese Americans began emigrating into California, what did they emigrate into? And in very ultra racist period where, as I said, the Ku Klux Klan was a dominant force in the state of California. And that in turn led to laws uh, against Asian Americans against Chinese Americans, whether it's alien land laws or uh, just plain old racial discrimination that that created the Fillmore, but it also created uh, Japantown and these other communities because people of color couldn't live anywhere else. The racial hierarchy, uh, however, you know, placed the value on white lives more than all others and black people on the bottom and then everybody else in between. There are instances where we were conditionally accepted and continue to be so. Uh, on the other hand, there are instances where we're targeted. And it's kind of like, what is it? Are we the model minority or are we the spreader of the Chinese virus? Um, I mean, that's, that is the nature of the hierarchy. And if you look at the Every statistic in California that matters, healthcare, education, the wealth gap, home ownership, black people are in the bottom of every single category. Now we're impacted too as Asian Americans and the more recent communities, particularly Cambodian Americans, Hmong Americans and others face terrible conditions in some of California's urban areas, but there is, a hierarchy and there's a constancy where we may be accepted, we may be conditionally, you know, uh, accepted. On the other hand, we could be viewed as the perpetual minority and not truly fully an American. But what's clear is black people are on the bottom. And so I think it's very revealing in terms of how the system how these norms, these cultural norms, this sort of racial pathology gets embedded in the systems that create our current day outcomes. Japanese Americans have experienced that to a degree and, and we can relate to that to a degree. I would also say the racial pathology that comes out of that infects everybody. The bias infects everybody. And so on the one hand, were rightfully, you know, the, the nation was horrified about the murder of George Floyd at the hands of Derek Chauvin. On the other hand, Tyree Nichols in Memphis, the LA City Council debacle in which uh, people of color are talking about other people of color in a negative way. I think that dominant cultural thinking infects everybody and because this is America, among other things, the first people see is race with all the bias and the stereotypes that come with it. This is a much deeper thing than just black reparations. It really shines a light on how the country needs to fix itself. And so uh, again, another reason why uh, this is not just a black issue, but it's an American issue we uh, all ought to be reckoning with. And because Japanese Americans have had direct experience, I think it's 
incumbent upon us to get involved in this. Great. And then lastly, on the threat of black reparations, uh, whether it's individual payments or systematic changes or a bit of both, do you have a personal vision of what you'd like to see uh, black reparations takes the form of? The task force had three charges. One, to document the harm, which it's done in a sweeping nearly 500 page report with 13 chapters covering from enslavement through housing, through employment, through um, impact on the family, healthcare, and so on. And that's available online. The second charge was to now examine what reparations California owes to black people within this sort of national history and what's California's role in that. And we're doing that now and we are obligated legislatively to produce a report in June of, of 2023. So that's coming. I will say that all options are on the table in terms of, I don't think anything's been ruled out in terms of forms of repair. And then the third legislative requirement is to educate the public on what's happened. And because the history is so buried, this becomes essential. And the report, the, it's called the interim report that's been released uh, in June of, of last year, documenting the harm is available online. That That is a big part of that. So that will be turned into, the plan is into curriculum, into uh, documentaries, and hopefully other things to educate the, the American public. Americans, for example, are just learning now about Tulsa and Greenwood and uh, the slaughter, you know, that ha of 300 people that happened there, even though it was over 100 years ago. And one of the startling things in the California's report is that the history is littered with these incidents. It didn't just happen in Oklahoma. California certainly had a role in that in terms of it, these incidents of hate and, and, and um, murder happened in our state too. So <clears throat> just educating the public about that is, is critical. The short answer as of the date of this interview is, is, is it's all being considered by the reparations task force and it will be released uh, in June of 2023. Okay, so um, what are the immediate next steps? I think there's, a, there's meetings in March and how many more meetings are there? And are there ways that Japanese Americans could be involved in this process, show support? give public testimony, how can... The hearings, the next set of hearings will be March 3rd and 4th of 2023. And I'm sure that there will be hearings in April, May, June, right up to the task force, which currently sunsets on June 30th, 2023. We are asking organizations for endorsements of, and people can, and organizations can endorse at the level they feel comfortable with. That could be, you know, it's time to at least study reparations. Other organizations are saying, you know, the we endorse the findings of the interim report. Again, that's available online. Uh, others are, are saying we endorse the task force and its efforts. But I think Japanese American, Asian American groups, to the extent that they can make a public statement about this is important. I'm hoping that by June, there'll be hundreds of organizations multiracial um, civil rights groups, faith organizations, um, educational groups, um, and, and community uh, civic organizations, all supporting reparations at, at some level. There will be in the, you know, a website on reparations that's going to be launched soon where these endorsements can be found. And I'd be glad to talk to anyone who's you know, certainly interested in this. So there would be uh, ample space to do public comments as well as at these hearings? I think so. I mean, every meeting, there is a period of one hour uh, for public comment. But uh, there's, I think we need more than just the hearings and public comment for groups in the Japanese American community and other communities to take a stand. Um, 
you know, I'm an old guy. So in our day, we used to have teach-ins. We used to do symposiums. And groups are doing that now. We need more of that. The conversation about reparations opens up a discussion in terms of even in our own history and how this racial pathology has not only impacted black Americans, but certainly us. And so we need to have these conversations too. And you don't need to have a pup, wait for a public hearing to do this. I mean, we could begin to begin organizing and taking a lesson from other movements, whether it's the civil rights movement or the anti-war protests or other things to begin to educate the public and spread awareness. And so it's happening certainly in civil rights organizations, but it's happening, for example, in bar associations that I'm connected with, uh, mainstream groups that are beginning the conversation. So there's a lot of ways to, to begin raising the public consciousness about this. Certainly the hearings that are coming up are one way, but that shouldn't stop any organization. I think even within San Francisco, Japantown, or in Los Angeles or other places, uh, we can begin to have this conversation. How can we support this movement? One way is to make public endorsements, another way to speak about it. Uh, this is going to be recommendations to the California legislature uh, on the recommendations. So groups can urge their legislators to support those proposals that they think further the repair and further the consciousness. Filmmakers and uh, literary, you know, uh, authors and journalists and people who can do creative works are doing that now. John Osaki, a Japanese American has uh, done a documentary excellent on reparations. And so there's ways that we can begin to, to spread this um, in our own network. Great. And, and finally, um, talking about the Dr. Clifford Ayueta Peace and Humanitarian Award, which you will be receiving at um, San Francisco's Day Remembrance. Um, on February 19th, uh, how do you think Dr. Weta's activism can inspire generations of Japanese Americans? And what are your thoughts about receiving the award? Well, to be mentioned in the same breath as Cliff Weta is an honor. Um, I met him shortly after I graduated from law school when he was um, championing the Aiva Taguri um, par pardon and exoneration. And uh, it was an uphill fight. I mean, that one where she was falsely accused of, of, of uh, espionage and disloyalty, and that was amplified by Hollywood, uh, was, you know, an amazing battle that he led. And then he also was an early adopter for Japanese American reparations and later championing other civil rights. Uh, and humanitarian rights. And so I think he was a model of integrity and uh, anyone who met him, uh, I think was influenced by him in that regard. And so to be associated with him in any capacity is an honor. And I think uh, he is one of the people, uh, heroes of the Japanese American community to look towards uh, and, a, and a role model. So uh, I'm glad they're is an award in honor of his name and I'm I'm honored to be a recipient of it. Okay. Well great Don. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on uh, uh, the fortieth anniversary of the Quorum Nobis cases, um black reparations movement and on Clifford Weta uh Peace and Humanitarian Award and uh, congratulations again, and thanks for all that you do consistently. Um, you know, since you were that young idealistic attorney, uh <laughs> Till now, I guess you're a, a more mature idealistic attorney. I mean, I'm an old, uh, <laughs> over the hill idealistic. Uh, I'm, I'm just pleased that people still want to, are willing to listen to my rant. And uh, thank you, Kenji, for this interview.